We don't look to a situation and go, well, is it done? Is it healed? We look to the Lord and say, no, it is done. My father already said it. So if my father already said it, I'm not looking to a circumstance to validate what God's word already said. I look to God's word and say, no, it's done. So that situation that wants to lie to me and tell me it's not, I shut that thing down and say, no, it is done. People have it the other way around. We don't want it the other way around. The other way around is a lack of faith. We don't check to see. We know it's done. The word of God has said it. It's spoken. Deuteronomy 28, 7. The Lord will cause. It's the Lord that will cause. Your enemies who rise up against you to be defeated before your face. It is the Lord that's going to cause your enemies who rise up against this, that have literally risen up against you. They're going to be defeated. And you're going to see it. Say, I'm going to see it. I shall see it. Because they're going to flee seven ways. Too many times people receive a healing. And they receive a healing or a deliverance, and they don't know how to keep it. And they'll go home, and, or they'll go somewhere else, and there'll be somebody that will speak another word that's opposite the Spirit of God. And because it makes logical sense to them, they use human reasoning, and they receive something that was not from God, but literally was an arrow to literally steal what they just received. So we, as Bible-believing as blood-bought, as Holy Ghost rollers filled with the spirit of the living God that are unashamed of the gospel and are unashamed of expressing our emotions unto the Lord will not allow that to take place because we need to know that there is an enemy and we fight this battle, but we know how to fight the battle and we know that we have actually already won. So we're not fighting to try to win. We're fighting because we've already won and our fight is a declaration of the word. That's what our fight is, a declaration of the sword of the Lord, the word. It's just reminding the devil, ha, huh, you're defeated, remember? Remember what Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, while I tell you the same thing, remember? So you speak forth the word, which is the sword. That's your fight, and that's your victory. And you have to rise up in faith in order to exercise this in authority. But to keep your healing, to keep your deliverance is not, is, is not difficult. It's not difficult. So, Father, right now, let every ear be opened. Let every ear, let every heart be open to understand. Let every ear be open to hearing. Let every eye be open to seeing exactly what you have for us in this word. Because, Lord God, we're bold and we're valiant in you. So if we claim that, then we actually have to have that fruit coming forth out of our lives every day of the week, not just on a service day. Every day of the week. So, Lord God, right now we, we posture ourselves in attendance, completely just attentive. We're attentive to you, Lord, that you would teach us by your Holy Spirit. And it would sink in deep. And it's ours. And we'll walk in it. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So in, Ma in Matthew chapter 12, and starting in verse 43, this is talking about an, when an unclean spirit returns. Now, you know that anytime we cast out a, a devil, it's attached to something. A demon spirit. First of all, you're believers. You're not going to be possessed. But you can be oppressed as a believer. You're not possessed. Okay? You have a Holy Spirit within you. But that doesn't mean you, don't, you can't be demonized, you know. It doesn't mean that you can't have a, a, a demonic influence that's taunting you and harassing you, right? The oppression, right? Um, the hearing, the, the, just the constant torment. Okay, so that's the enemy's plan. But as you grow in your walk in the Lord, you realize that you do not and should not allow that. You do not and should not allow that torment because you're giving him access. So you have to work at getting that thing out, right? Anytime that we cast out a demon spirit, Okay, we command it to be shut down. We cancel its effects. We command it to go. It's t attached to something. It's attached to a sickness. It's so it has to go, right? That sickness goes as that demon goes. Um, it's attached to an emotion that wants to keep you bound. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's loneliness. Maybe it's negativity, like a negative thinking, right? It's attached to something. It, it brings forth that something. And so, so when you cast that thing out, it has to go too. Right? But the word is very clear that when it goes, okay, it goes in the dry and arid places and it's seeking to find a place to land, another dwelling place. Uh, because, because those spirits, you know, they want to embody a person. They can't do anything on their own. They need to embody somebody, right? And we're going to read here and you're going to see how it goes and it searches for a willing, um, you know, person that's not paying attention or just is familiar to this pattern and then it finds its home. If it can't, it returns to the same individual that it left from, except for it comes back stronger, seven times stronger. 
right? You guys know this passage, right? But I want to read, most of you know it, but I want to read it to you from the word, and we're going we're gonna to discuss this today. So in Matthew 12 and in 43, it says, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Okay, that's assuming he didn't find another host, like a parasite, a host, like a, par a parasite needs a, a body to destroy, needs a body to eat through and to destroy all of your nutrients, right? A parasite does, but see, demons are just like that. They're like rats that eat all the junk that you left out and you wonder why you have rats. Get rid of the junk, get rid of the trash, right? Trash is like the sin in our lives, right? We got to get rid of that because those demons feed on this. So an unclean spirit goes out and goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. He then says, I will return to my house from which I came. And so I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. If you highlight your Bible, I would encourage you to highlight and circle that. It's empty. It's swept. And it's put in order. Now, you would think at first glance, oh, it's put in order. It's good. No, it's put in order. It's empty. The point here is that it's empty. The point here is it's swept clean and it's empty. It's not livable. It's empty. We are not to just get rid of of a spirit and not fill our lives with the word of God. We are not supposed to just empty something and let it be empty and, and, and void without filling with God's word consistently because a familiar spirit is what it's called. A familiar spirit will be happy to re-enter bringing its friends with it. Are you all following? And then this is when people go, well, I don't understand. I don't understand how that happened. I got healed in the glory. It was incredible. The power of God came. And, and I know that I was healed. I felt the power. Or all my pain left. Or I went to the doctor and I got a great report. Why did it come back? And people give up on believing the supernatural power of God because they don't know how to stand and fight for what's rightfully theirs. They buy into the lie. If God healed you in the glory, okay, in church, in a service, how you were decreeing the word of God, right? If God healed you, why are you not keeping your healing? Because it's not on God's end as to why you wouldn't keep the healing. It's on your end. So we have to claim it and say, oh, no, oh, no, I'm going to stand firm on the word of God. And if it says I'm healed by the stripes that Jesus bore in his body, then I am healed. And if I have a symptom, something that returns, I just continue to curse that thing and say, you're, you're defeated. Amen. You're defeated. You don't get to stay. Don't let it affect you in your, in your emotions, which is what it usually does, so that then you use a spiral. It's a downward spiral than fear and unbelief and everybody's negativity and everybody's advice, you know, that's not of God, comes in, and then now you're, you know, you're just going down the wrong path, and then things get worse. Why? Because it's familiar. You ever wonder about a familiar spirit? A familiar spirit is very sneaky. It's very tricky because you are familiar to it, so you don't see it. You don't recognize it at first. You're used to, well, every time this happens, you know, and then, you know, you just go downward. You know, you get depressed. You get lonely. And then it takes you two days, three days, three weeks before things turn around. But it turns around. That's a familiar spirit. That's a familiar spirit that attacks you. And you thought it was just you. You thought, well, that's just how I am. It's my hormones. People would say it's their hormones. Well, you know what? Command your hormones to align with the word of God. Oh, I did that. I think I've told you this when people would say, oh, you know, when you get just wait, just wait, you're talking crazy faith. You're talking crazy faith, but you're young. And I was in my 30s. And they're like, oh, just wait till you get into your 40s. Just wait. And, you know, your body, your, temp your, your whole hormones are just going to all start acting and acting up. And you're, you're going to see what we're talking about. You can't have, you don't get to have control over those things. It's, it's a, uh, what did she say? She said something like, uh, oh, it's science or it's, it's your body chemistry. It's your, it's your chemistry. That's what she said. It's your chemistry. It's not spiritual. And I thought, you know, this is a Christian that, like, they know the word of God. They're in these Bible-believing churches like we're not. Of course we are. Right? But they pride themselves on being a Bible-believing Christian. In other words, what that really means is no spirit. <laughs> no, no move of the Holy Spirit. Okay? No healing, no deliverance. Okay? So... So she says, oh, it's just, it's your, it's your body chemistry, so you can't, you can't do that. You just wait till you get into your 40s. So I said, oh, really? I said, oh, no, 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 no. So I actually served the, the devil notice before I got into my 40s, and I said, see where I'm going? You're not coming. See where I'm going? You're not coming. You can't follow me. 
I do not, re I refuse to accept that. And so she was telling you how, you know, you, all of a sudden that fire is going to be like, and not the godly kind of fire where your, your hormones are just like, oh my goodness, you turned up the heat, right? And so, um, so yeah, and so I just was like, okay. So I take authority. I will not have that. I decree it right now. That is not my lot in life. My body is my property. My, uh, it's my responsibility how I respond. Now for you, I can only do really what you have, what you allow me to. Because if you're standing there like a brick wall, unless the hand of God comes miraculously, and he does sometimes, right? But unless that happens, you're gonna, you're, if, you're, if you refuse to receive from me, you refuse to receive. Or from anybody that's praying, right? But my body, I have complete authority. And if I have faith for something, there's nothing and no one that's going to stop it, right? So I said, this is my body, devil, and you can't have it. Okay, so uh, sure enough, you know, I forget all about this conversation. But, you know, we move in. I'm in my 40s, and it happened. All of a sudden, it was like, oh, my goodness. And it took me back to that conversation. It was like this internal temperature. Somebody just turned up the heat. It was like fire, instant fire. There was no doubting it. There was no denying it. This was exactly what she said. It came to pass. I don't know how the devil got in. What in the world? I already said no. And, but you know what? I didn't go, oh, my gosh, it happened. Are you kidding? Squash that thing. Stomp on the devil. I said, oh, no, devil. I don't accept this, and I rejected it and rebuked it and commanded it to go. And it immediately, immediately, my, the, my body chemistry, the body clock, the temperature, whatever you want to call it, all went back down to normal. 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 Don't buy into the lies. And then it happened twice. I don't know, it was like a couple of, I don't remember the time frame. But anyway, move on down the line. It was a little while later. And then it happened again. And I said, really, devil? You're going to try this a second time? Well, a second time I cast you out. And I command you to go. And it stopped. And it never happened again. Two times. And it never happened again. So it doesn't have to only be for that, does it? So what happens is, is that people expect certain things to come about. They expect them without realizing that they expect them. They expect them because they're familiar. If something is familiar to you, you are not aware necessary, necessarily when it starts to knock on your door because you haven't really worked on the issues as to why it's there in the first place. And you allow those things to remain. And usually it has something to do with a broken area in your soul, in your emotions. That's undealt with. And because it's undealt with, then you say a certain thing, oh, I decree the blood of Jesus is enough for me. But you're, if your soul remains unhealed, that thing is actually still allowed to come and bother you. In other words, familiar spirit comes back seven times stronger because you haven't allowed your soul to be healed yet. How do you get your soul healed? You stay in the word of God. Do you know my granddaughter said something to me yesterday that was just so beautiful. She was helping me on the live, but unfortunately we had really bad audio. And so you all couldn't hear what she said. I heard what she said. She's sitting right next to me. And she said, so the more that you read your Bible, the deeper it gets in your soul. The more that you read your Bible, the deeper it gets in your soul. Where do we need to be healed? In our soul. Why? Because when we cast out a demon, because it's familiar, it does try to come back. And it does come back seven times stronger. We're going to finish reading that one verse. I only got to. I didn't read the whole thing yet, but we will. It's hard when they feel the Holy Spirit just pouring in and pouring in and pouring in. And you're like, ah, submit to God. Resist the devil and you will flee. Yes. James 4, 7. We'll submit to God. We resist the devil, and he will flee. James 4, 7. Yes. And we do that. It's what we're supposed to do. Right? But don't neglect healing of the soul. Because he wants you healed in your soul. Body, soul, and spirit. How do you get healed in your soul? You let the word of God go deeper within you. You sit before your holy, this holy God, this incredible, your maker, your best friend, and you let him put his fingerprint. You let him change what needs to be changed. You let him expose the lies because bottom line, the reason that the people remain, people stay sick or, or like in turmoil and stuff, they are believing a lie. That is the bottom line. God doesn't want you sick. And he doesn't want you tormented. 
He does not want his children sick, and he doesn't want you tormented. God is not trying to teach you a lesson, and he didn't give you sickness to try to teach you a lesson or to get you closer to him. Because there are that people do believe that, you know, that, that that's, this is, this God's got, given you this so that you can be closer to him. Now, does sickness bring you closer to God? Actually, it does. All kind of pain does, not just sickness, if you allow it, because it doesn't own, always. Sometimes people go the other way. They just go in their flesh even more, and they make matters even worse. But it can bring you closer to the Lord, but it's not because that's not the reason that it's come, right? And it's come because we have a devil. We have an enemy, an enemy of our souls, right? And so we need to get our souls healed, and we get our souls healed by staying in the Word of God. Let me tell you, the, the best times sometimes to read, first of all, you should be in the Word every single day. But the best times that you should really be reading your Word is when you want to do so the least, it's when you, want, when you want to do so the least is when you should really open up that word. Why? Because it's your soul that's pushing against the very words of God that actually need to read that word because it's nourishment and it's healing. The word of God is life and health to your whole soul and, that, and to your whole body. And that's Proverbs chapter 4. The word of God is life and health to your whole body. The word of God. Well, if you're, if you're in a place where you're down and discouraged... Open up that word. And so back to Matthew 12, 43, starting in 43. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes through dry places seeking rest, and it finds none. Then it says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Remember, that's not a good thing, to be empty. No. You know, and that's exactly what even um, yoga, meditation, and all that kind of stuff, that's not of God. Okay, yoga, meditation, all that, it's not of God. I don't care if you say it's holy yoga. There's nothing holy about yoga, right? And so people go, they're going to empty their minds. They're going to posture themselves in these positions, um, and they're going to empty their minds. But we were never told to empty our minds. We were told that we are to renew our minds, Romans 12. We're to renew our minds according to the word of God. Romans 12 in chapter, in chapter 12 and in verse 2 talks about renewing your mind, right? And so we renew our mind by the word of God. We're not supposed to empty our mind. We're supposed to fill our mind with the word of God, right? Yes. And so the, the fact that they came back and they, they found it empty, swept, and put in order is not a good thing. Because a house that is unoccupied, and I'm talking about your body right now, your life. A house, a person, a life that is unoccupied is a life that is vulnerable for attack. A second attack. Are we all following an empty house is a lot as a house that's it's vulnerable for a second attack, yeah. or maybe third and fourth. So look at 40, 45. He goes, remember, he finds the house empty. He goes, and he takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. More wicked than himself? Yeah, he takes his buddies. Wick, more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. The last state is worse than the first. That's pretty serious, you guys. Let's turn to Luke 11 and 24. Same portion of scripture, but just in another gospel. And it says here, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. He says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it swept and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and they dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. Not good. Say not good. But blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep the word of God. How do we keep the word of God? By doing it. I'm telling you, fill your mind with the word of God constantly, constantly. And as you do, the devil doesn't have any access point. And he can't steal. He may try to steal, but he actually cannot steal and take from you the healing that God has already promised, right? Okay, let's go to 2 Corinthians 12 and in verse 7. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Actually, I'm going to start with verse 1 so I can read this in context and so that you all understand. Because sometimes if you just pull a, a scripture out and you haven't read this portion in a while, I, don't, I, want, to, I want you to hear the whole thing. Verse 1 in ver chapter 12. So it is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. This is Paul speaking. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven. 
And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, how he was caught up into paradise and he heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for me to utter. Sometimes people go into the, into the places of, of, you know, like just the Lord where he brings you into the incredible encounters with the Lord and they want to share every single last word. Well, if God told you to, but did he? Right? We got to remember to keep certain things holy, need to be holy. They need to remain holy, right? If God tells you, you, you do. But if not, certain things are not needed to be shared. Some things are just for you. So caught up into paradise and he heard inexpressible words, which is not lawful for man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except for in my infirmities. For, for though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Read it again. Verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of revelations, a thorn in the flesh, a thorn in the flesh was given to me by a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I be exalted, lest I get too prideful, right? To buffet means to strike repeatedly, to treat with violence or to harass. Sounds like what demons do. It sounds like what demons do, to buffet, to attack, to harass. Paul was talking about a spirit that would want to torment him, harass him, buffet him, attack him. So if you are here listening to my voice and you're saying, wow, that happens to me sometimes, like I know that it's not God. And I know it's not me, and it's just this voice. I have grown to be to understand that it's not me, it's not God. But I can't deny that there are times where it's this demonic spirit, and it's like I feel, and you can fill in the blank, you know, depressed, discouraged, angry, frustrated, whatever it might be, you know, like other sins, right? That you, whatever it might be, right? The spirit of rage, spirit of anger. I don't know what it is, but you know it's not you. And all this, Paul is saying the very same thing. It's the same thing. I say this so that you would take courage and be encouraged. Instead of lying to yourself and say, oh, that doesn't happen to me, because that's pride. Instead, say, you know what? That's a buffeting spirit. It's exactly what Paul was talking about, and I command that thing to go. Your job is to command it to go, right? Your job is not to say, well, it's there, so I can't do anything about it. Because that's what, that's what the, a lot in the church have been taught. Well, can't do anything about it. Have you guys heard that? Well, you can't do anything. You know what? God's in control of the weather. You can't change it. Like, I just want to cringe when I hear that. If you need, if the weather needs to be changed for a specific reason, all God needs is one faith-filled person that understands their authority and stands in the gap and commands that weather to change. That's all he needs. That's it. And it's happened many, many times in my own life, and I'm sure in some of yours as well, when it's needed. Now, we're not going out every day just commanding, because that's, that's pride and that's arrogance, and that's stepping outside of what you're called to do. See, authority, because that's what we're talking about, bottom line, have, keeping your authority for healing, for, for deliverance and sickness and all that kind of stuff, right? So, but your authority that's in Christ, right, we're not flaunting it. You shouldn't go around flaunting it, but you also shouldn't be hiding it. You should be exercising it because you're a soldier of Christ. And you understand that you have been called to position, your position, the position God has put you in. You also understand that the more that you use your authority, positions change. Say, upgrade is mine. In Jesus' name, because the little that I have, I use, and God brings the increase. Authority increases as you use what you have. But you don't flaunt it. You also don't deny it. Concerning these things, 
or this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So here he's concerning these things. He pleaded with the Lord three times that this buffeting spirit would depart from him. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Weakness, Therefore, most gladly, I says, I would rather boast in, in my infirmities than the power of Christ may rest upon me. Infirmities there means lack of strength or weakness. People think that word infirmities means sickness. Well, I'm going to boast in my sickness. It's talking about lack of strength. It's talking about like a physical lack of strength, a weakness. Oh, I don't know that we're all getting this. I don't know that we're all getting this yet. Are we, are, are we all following? Okay, I'm going to back up again. Verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you, and it is. Right? God's grace is sufficient for us. My strength is made perfect in weakness. God's strength is made perfect when we feel weak. We will, we will not boast in infirmities or in a lack of strength or in weakness. We're not going to boast. But instead we're going to boast in the glory of the Lord. Right? And so when an assignment of the enemy comes and it's a boast, it, it's, causing, it's, it's causing that torment that Paul was talking about. You have authority to turn to James 4, 7. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee. Now, Paul was asking the Lord to remove it. And this is where many people get stuck. Instead of taking the authority themselves and telling the devil, get behind me, Satan. They wait for God to do what God says you're to do. Oh, it's subtle. And people go, see, he prayed three times. And three times, it, God says, no, my grace is sufficient. Absolutely. Thank God for the grace of God. It's sufficient. You should encourage yourself that God's grace is sufficient for you. You should encourage yourself in that. But you shouldn't stay there and go, well, this is my lot. God's grace is sufficient. Paul prayed three times. That thorn in the spirit didn't go. That there was a reason, and God is using this as an example for us to say, you need to wake up and speak to what needs to be spoken to and stop expecting God to do what you're supposed to do. Are we all following? Are some of the religious mindsets coming off? Because I'm telling you, there's a lot of twisted thinking when it comes to this scripture. And instead, you know, back to Matthew 12 and, and Luke 11, where it says that the, you know, the enemy comes back and seven times stronger because the house was clean and swept and kept unoccupied. It goes hand in hand. Don't let your house be unoccupied. Let it be occupied with the right thing. Let it be occupied with the word of the Lord. And last scripture, I want you to turn over to Ephesians and chapter 6. Because here's what we're supposed to do. And we're supposed to stand against the wiles of the enemy, you guys. Look at, look at Ephesians 6 and 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Stand against. Against. Say against. If I'm going to stand against something, then I'm not going to be in agreement with that something. I'm not going to say, well, you know, God didn't remove it from me, so it must be his will. I'm not going to say, well, I prayed for healing, I received healing, I received deliverance, but it came back, so it must be God's will. We're going to stand against the what? Wiles of the whom? Of the devil. We're going to stand against the wiles, the trickery, the schemes, the demonic devices that the devil sends your way. And you need to ask the Lord, and here's where it gets tricky. You need to ask the Lord, Father, what is familiar to me? Because people fall in the area of familiarity because they don't see it because they're familiar to it. Other people would see it, but you may not see it at first because you're familiar. Your guard is down. down. You're used to that something taking place. You're used to it. Well, every time this person walks in, you start acting differently, but you don't see it. Everyone else sees it. Hey, you never act like that unless a certain individual walks in the room. Why? There's a familiar spirit that's at, involved. It's causing you to act in a way that you don't normally act. But when you recognize, I'm just giving you one example. When you recognize it, the familiarity loses its power. Why? Because you get to the root of it. 
when you recognize, oh, you little sneaky devil, that's what you were doing. And I fell for it without even thinking. It was familiar. And it continues to go on. And he, the devil brings seven times stronger. You know, and it becomes this constant battle, this constant fight. But let every familiar spirit today be exposed and revealed to you. Be exposed and revealed to you. Because we're not going to walk that way, unaware of the enemy's devices, when we're told in the word to expose them. We're told in the word of God to stand against them. We're told in the word of God that their wiles and their trickeries and their schemes of the devil, and we're to stand against them, we're to expose them, we're supposed to say no. We stand against, not stand in agreement.